There are few things in running more polarizing than whether carbs are good for you, bad for you, or make no real difference one way or the other. It can actually get quite nasty in some of the darker corners of the running community, like from the people who don't eat anything that casts a shadow. No, God! But I need to know, are carbs really as bad as some people say? Or are they misunderstood? Or are they not misunderstood? Do, do people understand them? This week, I've enlisted the help of Rini McGregor, author of the excellent book More Fuel You and best-selling author in the field of sports nutrition as well as leading sports dietitian and thoroughly lovely person. So I'm aiming to answer the five questions that I hear the most when it comes to carbs and to help you form your own opinion. And if it does just that, consider subscribing but no hard sell. But I guess my first question would be, where did the idea that low carbs would be good for training in the first place? And what's the theory behind it? Over to Rini. Okay, so the low carb, high fat diet came about probably about five or six years ago in that there were academic scientists looking at how, of course, we can improve um, our ability to perform in endurance events. So anything that's kind of, you know, uh, longer than 90 minutes, for example, there was this kind of question around, can we, is there any way in which we can maximise um, our fat stores in order to preserve some of our carbohydrate stores so that we can keep going for longer fundamentally and you know when you look at this the kind of basic theory it does make sense and so the theory goes that if we can start to tap into our fat stores more can we become more efficient this concept of fat adaptation or low carb high fat diets came into play because there was this assumption that if you remove carbohydrate from your diet then your more your body will have to go in search of finding fuel from somewhere else and fat would be the next option the problem is human bodies are not textbook and this was something that was really interesting working in this field is that it was clear that there were benefits to fat fat adaptation but again when you started looking at general sort of sports science around this what was clear is that actually training has a much more uh, has a much bigger impact on fat adaptation than your diet I think that when it comes to carbs, we're all on a kind of continuum. No one responds exactly the same as somebody else. So if we rule out the extremes of no carbs at all, keto, and only carbs, then there's a bandwidth to play around in. And although the vast majority fall into a carb-centered approach, you might be someone who responds better with a low-carb, high-fat diet. But what is important to recognize is that you'd be in the minority in terms of what the evidence suggests. But you need to make that decision yourself. But for me, I guess what stood out the main point was that the downside to fat adaptation is that you lose what we call metabolic flexibility, as in a body's ability to utilize fats or to utilize carbohydrates when you wanted to. And recent studies are starting to show that with an increase in fat adaptation, there comes a downturn in your economy when you're running and therefore leads to a downturn in performance. But here's the thing. What about fasted training? Because I've done it in the past, I still do it now, and I've heard lots of people say a lot of good things about it. So is there any benefit to training without carbohydrates and how would you go about it? That was the next question I wanted to answer. The thing that's important to establish here that there is, there is a term in sport known as training low. And this again is the kind of training in a sort of carb depleted or in fasted state that can also enhance fat adaptation. The reality is, is that training low does not mean at all that you do not eat carbs. Training low means that perhaps you would do a training session in a carb depleted, in a fasted state. And the other big thing about this is that as soon as those sessions are finished, you should then actually consume <coughs> carbs in terms of um, your recovery meal, your next recovery meal, but also throughout the rest of the day, dependent on what your carb needs would be for that. And this is you joining me on a typical morning fasted run. <sighs> yeah, okay, right. It's not typical. No way I usually get to run next to a beach. This is amazing, but you get the idea. I had to stop running for this bit, because look, look at this. I am on a fasted run, but I think 
the thing that's important to distinguish for me about fasted runs is that A, for me, they're necessity. This is not something I ever really planned to do. I didn't go, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna run without carbohydrates. It's just early in the morning. I got up at, in the fives a.m. and then I'm running. And to be honest with you, I think I would be uncomfortable if I woke up any earlier and tried to have breakfast. So out of necessity, these are fasted runs. But they're not bad fasted runs. So here's what I think is the biggest misconception about this type of session, and that's the difference between training fasted and being carb depleted. So it's not about removing carbohydrate at all. It's actually about training in a particular state, but actually making sure that you're providing your body with the carbohydrate for the rest of the day. And also that these sessions should really not be done more than twice a week. And just for reference, this is a 10K zone two effort. No hard stuff in here at all, just getting the miles done. In fact, it's part of my taper, so I'm keeping it easy on purpose because I've got 10 days left until UTMB. When you started looking at general sort of sports science around this, what was clear is that actually training has a much bigger impact on fat adaptation than your diet. So what I mean by that is, is that if you are somebody who is training for endurance events, you're going to do quite a lot of longer distance training. And actually in that training, your body naturally becomes better at using fat as a fuel without you having to change your diet. Um, and our brain absolutely uses sort of 20 to 25% of all the energy consumed to function on a daily basis. So if you don't provide your body with sufficient carbohydrate to be able to produce that, then the brain has to go in search of other sources of energy. People forget that you need carbohydrate for your central nervous system. If you think about a race, there'll be points in the race where you start to fall over more, you start to make poor decisions. All of this is your central nervous system getting fatigued because understandably you're putting a lot of stress on your body when you are doing any sort of activity. I mean, this is what I take away from this fasted run and fasted runs in general is that, yeah, if you do fasted runs, your body is gonna get used to and better at metabolizing fat, using fat, train low with carb depletion, then put it back in because your body needs carbs for a lot of other things that are not exercise. Do you know what? We'll get into that point next, as in what carbs do or are there bad versions of them? Another of the biggest arguments I hear is that carbs are bad for you because you'll A, put on weight, two, reduce your insulin sensitivity, D, become pre-diabetic, or five, all of the above. But we already know from my previous chat with Matt Fitzgerald that carbs don't all make you gain weight. Maybe the wrong ones do. You know, uh, high quality carb rich foods are at the center of most of the meals and snacks that the most successful endurance athletes eat. But does Rini agree? Carbohydrates are very misunderstood. And mm. one of the examples I use a lot is, you know, if we were looking at a bag of jelly babies, for example, so a big bag of jelly babies, like the ones that you can buy for your car journeys, will be around 150 grams of carbs. That's quite a lot of carbohydrate in one go. Now the equivalent yeah. would be three fist-sized baked potatoes. So three medium-sized baked potatoes would deliver 150 grams of carbs. It's a really good way of demonstrating that carbohydrate comes in lots of different forms and it's been given a really bad press but actually there's a place for all of it you know but it's knowing when and how to use it but it should definitely be something that is included because the body needs it for so many functions so what seems to be making people think that carbs affect your insulin sensitivity so this is where people start to panic that, my God, if I eat loads of carbohydrate or loads of sugar, that people are being told that it can make them pre-diabetic. But that's not the case. It might do if you are susceptible, but it's unlikely to if you actually live a fairly healthy lifestyle. So even in individuals that have a type 2 diabetes, the first form of, um, I suppose, therapy or treatment is actually losing weight and managing your diet. 
So, right. you know, so and it's about being more active because we know that actually being active helps your insulin response as well and helps to keep your blood sugars down. So being active is a important aspect of it. For me, it comes down to what types of carbs are we putting into our system and when. French fries every night is carbs, but it's processed. Like sweets when not racing, maybe the right carbs, but at the wrong time. We said earlier, we are all on a spectrum. It's just working out how to make it all work for us. And there's got to be a little trial and error involved. Okay, leading on from the thought that carbs can help you put on weight. By the way, this is our Friday treat, so I'm unashamedly, that's the reason I'm showing you it. The next point it leads me on to is that kind of thought that if I cut carbs out of my diet, I'm gonna lose weight, I'm gonna be faster. And I wanna just dispel a few rumors on that front because I think that's quite important. What became apparent to me from reading Rini's book and chatting with Rini is that actually what we think would happen when we reduce carbohydrates from our diet is the opposite. But I'm going to let Rini explain. What we know is that when there's a very big energy deficit, and actually physiological studies would say that you don't really want a deficit more than 100 calories, believe it or not. So mm. if you start having these big, you know, like we hear... PTs giving out advice to people to go on 1500 calorie diets or even less. So what happens is initially you do get a little, you do get a bit of weight loss, absolutely. But again, when you look at the longer term studies, they're not sustainable because what happens is when you create this big deficit, the body hasn't got enough energy to maintain these biological functions that it needs to do. And so it starts to shut down important biological functions. So generally it starts with things like your immune system, hormones, particularly like testosterone and estrogen, they get downregulated. But also more importantly, it will start to say, well, actually, I just need to put everything into preservation mode here because I can't sustain this. And so it downregulates your metabolism. It's the opposite of what we've been told. It's the opposite of what we believe. You know, by going on these very low calorie diets, by creating these massive deficits through extreme exercise and not fueling properly, actually you're doing, you're setting yourself up to fail fundamentally. And testament to how complicated the body is, is that when you reduce carbohydrates too much, your body goes in search for homeostatic control and it actually slows down your metabolism and everything is the opposite to what you think would happen. You actually end up not losing weight at all or even gaining weight. I am allowed to do this. It is my Friday. It is my day where I'm allowed to treat myself, by the way. Finally, the counterpoint I hear so much is that it works for this person or that person. And my answer is always good but you're not that person. Tim Noakes is a great example, a passionate advocate for low carb, high fat, but now very much on the fringe of the argument because of some recent controversies and statements that he's made. But then you've got low carb advocate and pro ultra runner Zach Bitter, much more balanced guy with a reflective approach and an understanding that what works for him might work for you, but it also might not. I'm not here to tell you to do one thing or the other. I'm here to share my opinion, but to urge you to form your own. As a sports scientist, I know that theories and approaches are always evolving, but I do tend to go with the weight of the current evidence, but does at the moment lean towards a carb-centered diet for most, but not all athletes. All you can do is like both Matt and Rini say, find what works for you within that spectrum eat individually, experiment. Lower carb intake could work well for you, and that's genuinely great if it does, but make sure you also try a carb-centered diet for comparison. Listen to opinions, of course, but form your own based on your experiences. Not some scientist, not some pro runner, not some YouTuber, you. And if this video brought a smile to your face, gave you any value in any way, or you just didn't mind looking at a haggard old runner, then consider subscribing to the channel for more of where that came from. And you're definitely going to like this video, which is daily diet habits that you could implement right now. Change your diet, change your life. That's what we're here for. And I'll see you Sunday.